So my name's Chris Hunter. I'm in charge of the GigaDB, which I'll tell you all about in a moment. Uh, so thank you all for, for coming back after coffee, and I see some still filtering in, so I'll just carry on regardless. Uh, the first thing I need to do here is just a small apology, because my, it's not, as I was preparing my slides, I realized the title of my talk was slightly misleading. So using ontologies to curate data publications should really be curate data associated with data publications, because we don't curate the publication itself. That's the author's responsibility to their paper. So we just curate the data that goes with the papers. So I want to tell you a bit about what Giga Science Press is, what GigaDB is, and then give you a short demo of, of what GigaDB actually looks like on, on the website. Um, I was going to do a live one, but I bottled out of that, so I've just got some screenshots for you, so you'll have to put up with those. I can give a live demo to anyone that's interested if, if, if you want to in person. Uh, and then I'll tell you a bit about what we curate in GigaDB and, and how the ontologies fit into those, those sections. So first off, Giga Science Press is actually the publishing division of BGI. So it was set up uh, about 12 years ago by Laurie Goodman. Um, and it, it essentially it is made up of three parts. So we've got Giga Science, the journal, uh, and Gigabyte, the journal. So Giga Science is published in, in collaboration with Oxford University Press. And Gigabyte is published in collaboration with this new company called River Valley Technologies, and it's a whole new system. And that's a whole other talk, which I'm not going to go into, but if you're interested, come and find us and we can talk about it. And at the bottom there, we've got GigaDB, which is a database of all of the data that is discussed or described in either of those publications. So it services both journals. So what is GigaDB? Well, it's, it's a curated and maintained data repository that ensures all of the data associated with the journals with the papers published in either of those journals is transparent and reproducible and, and basically fair. That's what we're aiming at, is to make things fair. So we organize the data into data sets. Normally, that is one data set per manuscript, although occasionally we, we slice things down if it makes more sense to have multiple data sets for a manuscript, we can do that as well. It's done on a case-by-case -case basis. And we provide a home for any of the data that doesn't already have a natural home in one of the community resources. So, the common example is sequencing data. So we don't host sequencing data in GigaDB. That goes to the SRA or, or, or one, of the, one of the partners of the INSDC. We try to manage it by the FAIR principles. Now, I'll be honest here, we've not actually done a FAIR assessment to see exactly how FAIR we are, but we will at some point in the future. And as, as, as Marco said earlier in the, in the keynote, there's always more you can do to be more FAIR. So there's, there's always work to be, to be going on with that. And then GigaDB also provides a DOI to make everything citable. So every data set that's in GigaDB, in GigaDB is its own citable unit. So we can make things imply with force as well. So GigaDB is actually made up of, of sort of various parts. So the bit that most people will be familiar with is GigaDB.org. So it's the website that people go to. It's the sort of user interface. And that's what people see. But we also have a GitHub repository where all of the code that creates that website is held, and that's all open source as well. We have the back-end PSQL database where all the information and the metadata that I'm going to talk about is held. And then there's the actual cloud server where the files themselves are held. So there's sort of more to it than just the website. But essentially, what people see is the website. What goes into GigaDB? Well, I've kind of alluded to this. Basically, it's, it's anything that is associated, that is data that is associated with the manuscript. So what we're not is a supplemental file server. So if you think of traditional journals where the the excess text that doesn't fit in the manuscript, they just put as a PDF, as a, as a supplement of file. We don't host those. We're not interested in the narrative. We're interested in the data itself. So the infographics, no, we're not interested in those. We just want the actual data. So if they put a summary table of, of information in their manuscript, we want the data that was used to create that summary table. So we do store all of the data, and then we annotate the metadata on top of that with the help of the authors, because it's their data. They know it. So what is data? Well, in terms of... Because both our journals are broad spectrum across the whole of the life sciences, we cover a broad spectrum of data. So everything that doesn't have a natural home elsewhere, we put into GigaDB. So some of the things there that perhaps don't necessarily get thought of as data are the software files. So where historically people have used GitHub for, for publishing software and, and code like that, we would actually take a snapshot of that GitHub because then you know that the thing that we've got the snapshot of is the one that they were talking about in the manuscript. There's now other ways of doing that. So the software archive, we're, we're looking at uh, using the, the software heritage archive instead of taking our own snapshots, because we don't need to host them if somebody else already does. So we're finding ways of, of sort of hosting less data if we can, but making sure that we're still 
having everything as archived as it can be for that manuscript. Um, and intermediary data files. So sometimes people create these intermediary data files that are very difficult to reproduce, particularly if it's something like um, a synthetic data set that they've used for testing something, where it's sort of a, a randomized script. But actually, if you then rerun that randomized script, you get a different set of data. So we try and host intermediary data files in that respect as well to make things fully reproducible. Um, so metadata, I think I'd probably skip over this. Everybody knows that metadata is data about data, so we'll move on from that. I just want to give you an anatomy of uh, what the GigaDB data set looks like. This is just a citation of the data set that I'll be looking at, so you can see we make things citable as a, as a data set itself. So this is a screenshot of the top half of our data set page. Um, so you can see we put, so the first thing to do with ontologies I'm going to mention is the fact that we categorize our data sets into types. So we have a data set type um, flag, in this case it's an imaging data set, so that's got that flag on there. We can put multiple flags on there as well, so it doesn't have to be just the one. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So, excuse me. Every data set page has the title. Normally this is supporting data for, is the prefix for whatever the manuscript title is. It doesn't have to be, we can, we can adjust that as, as required. So if we've got multiple data sets for one manuscript, we have to adjust it because you can't have the same title for, for multiple data sets. And there's the citation information in the middle there. And then there's a description. So the description part is, at the moment, we're only basically copy and pasting the, the abstract from the manuscript. So this is something we want to work on moving forward is to have a more structured data description. So that the data set actually has its own description of what the data is rather than just saying, this is all about this manuscript that we've just copied and pasted the, uh, the, the abstract for. So that's future work to be done. And at the bottom, there's a contact submitter button, so you're able to get hold of the person that originally submitted it. Um, we make sure that you have to be logged in and have a user account for that to be available, so we're not just putting it out there publicly for everyone to use. And there's other features on there, and I'm happy to talk about there if, if, if anybody wants to come and find me later. And if you scroll down, so if you notice the uh, previous slide, we've got uh, additional details there, additional details there, so I've literally just scrolled down the page. Um, so the top part of that is, is where it links to the peer review manuscript. So effectively the manuscript that these data are related to or come from is, is cited there. So you've got the link. And then there's any other additional things you've got, uh, like this, this particular imaging data set, they've got the 3D images within Sketchfab and Thingiverse. So they're usable and you can actually scroll around them. And, and the, the tab there called 3D models is actually uh, effectively an iframe of the Sketchfab um, implementation, so you can actually zoom in and zoom out. And I haven't got that slide in here, but it's quite funky. You can sort of rotate around and see the, see the surface rendered image of, of that particular thing. So I'm just going to zoom in on here to show you the sort of ontologies that we use and where a lot of them fit in. So most of the ontologies that we use are on the sample information. So if we zoom in on that, you can see that the life stage there is adult, and we've put a, a, an ontology term for that, the same for the sex got the PASO term for female. So we don't specify exactly which ontologies you have to use, but we try to make sure that they are from an ontology of some sort so that it's tractable and there's a definition of it so you know exactly what we're talking about. So it's the same screen, but I've just moved along the next tab. So you've got samples and files. This is the files tab. So you can see there's a whole list of files there and we put on the data, set, the, the data type. So each file has its own type, so it could be imaging, and then that imaging file type could be of a different format, so there's various different formats that images could be held in. So we also put a format on there. And then the other box that's circled is just showing that we have um, attributes that we can add, any list, any, any sort of attributes that we think could be useful on that file, we can add them there so that they're publicly visible and eventually machine readable as well, which is not yet. Um, so that's where we can add in extra information for there. All of the files have, a, have an MD5 checksum, which just enables you to check the, the integrity of the file after you've downloaded it. So this definition of, of what data curation is, so effectively it's just making sure that everything is, is constantly updated with the most relevant information. Obviously, becoming at the end of the cycle, or the end of one part of the cycle, means that we're not doing it throughout its life cycle, we're just doing it at one point in the cycle. But we help with the classification and cataloging and we hope that it helps the authors think about this the next time they're doing something. And actually, repeat authors do come to us with more information the second time around than they did the first time around, so it's, it's good in that respect. 
And obviously it promotes discovery, utility and reuse, all the things you'd expect with FAIR. So I think I've kind of touched on this as I've gone through, but as, we, as the things that we curate are sort of split into three levels. We look at the data set level, so the top, the first, top of the first page that I showed you had the title and the authors and all that sort of information, and that's pretty standard for everything that gets published. You always have to have those sorts of information. Um, but then we also add into that top level the external links to things like Thingiverse or Sketchfab or the SRA or whatever, whatever external links there are to do with that data set. And then we annotate the samples. So actually, a lot of our time is spent on the samples because the authors seem to put the information in their manuscript, but it never makes it into any sort of formal database. So we spend quite a lot of time um, curating the samples to make sure that all that information um, is, is there somewhere. We try and encourage them to also put it into the, data set, into the databases, like biosamples and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's the author's choice. We can't force them to do that, but we do try and encourage them to. Um, and actually, just a word on the sort of information we collect there. So a lot of the terms that we ask for in our sample information come from the Genomic Standards Consortium. Um, and I've got a slide on that later. And I just want to give a plug for the Genomic Standards Consortium conference coming up in August. So there's a lot of our sample uh, attribute names are from the Genomic Standards Consortium. And then the files. So as I've already said, we host the, the, the individual files, and we have to make sure we put a description on each of those which is actually very useful for the, for the web interface, so you can see what is meant to be in those files. So if you go to somewhere like uh, Figshare, you've just got a whole bunch of files with no description of them, so we actually make sure we have a file description on every file. So in order to help our submitters doing this, obviously we don't want to do it all for them, so we want to try and get as much information from the authors as, as possible, because it's their information, so we provide them with checklists and guidelines. Um, and then the one that's outlined there is the data set type. So we have a controlled vocabulary of those at the moment, which is only about 15, 16 different terms, something like that, which was, it's basically been built up over the years of just sort of, well, that'd be a good term to run this one. So we've sort of done it ad hoc. And what we want to do, oh, was 23 different terms. So what we want to do is move towards using the, the fair sharing subject ontology, SRAO. But because that's over 400 terms, it would just be too many for us to use and it covers a much broader subject area than we're interested in. So we've created a slim of those, and over the next few months, we intend to map all of our terms to those terms, and then start using the SRAO terms moving forward. And in fact, the Gigabyte Journal already uses those terms as subjects within the Gigabyte Journal itself. So we're, we're part way to doing that already. So for samples, as I mentioned already, we've, we, we try to follow the, the MIXS standard from the Genomic Standard Consortium for a lot of the stuff, particularly the sequencing data, but we also superimpose those same sort of terms onto the other sorts of data sets. So they're, they're actually cross usable basically that most of the, the terms in the GSC are to do with samples themselves. So it actually just, it's, it's perfectly uh, extensible across different sorts. And we, okay, we've put required down there for all of those, but it's not, a hard requirement. It's just a, we really, really recommend you do this. <laughs> and we come back and ask them for it repeatedly until they give it to us. But uh, if they haven't got it, then we can't add it, obviously. So of the, the various different terms, so I've just listed here a whole load of the, the, the attributes that we ask for in some cases and the, the ontologies that we recommend that they use. So particularly for, for the broad and local scale environmental context, we use the ENVO terms and they're the only terms we try and add in. We don't try and we don't let people just put in their own random text because Endo is pretty comprehensive. And then the, the third stage are the files. The file metadata, again, we provide a list of the sort of things that we should um, ask people to do. And again, ooh, yeah. The data types are also from another controlled vocabulary. So we actually, again, we've, we've curated this one ourselves. We haven't taken it from anywhere, but originally it was based on the EDAM ontology. So we've diverged, well, I haven't actually checked how much we've diverged from EDAM, but <laughs> it's been a fair few years since we originally set it up. So I'm, I'm guessing we've diverged quite a lot from EDAM. Um, and it might have been an interesting experiment to actually go back and, and remap our terms and see what's changed and where we, where we should be adding new ones and things, but that'd be a, a future job. And then, um, so the categories are not formats, that's the important thing to mention there. So if you, if you think about sequencing alignments, you can have lots of different formats for a sequencing alignment, but it's still a sequencing alignment type. So that's why we put the type on there as well as just the, not just the formats. 
So this is an example of, of our, our checklist for genomic data for particular files that we expect to see. So not only do we stipulate what information should be with the file, we try to have a standardized list of the things that we expect to see with every particular data site. So we've got eight, every particular data set. So we've got these checklists for all the different, well, not all of the different types, but certainly a lot of the different data set types. We've got particular checklists so that we can encourage people to include all of these different things. It gives us as curators and a list of things to go down the list and tick to say, yeah, yeah, we've seen that, we've seen that, we've seen that, they've got this, etc. So there's one of those um, and they're, they're listed on the website under the, the guides for each particular data set type. Uh, and this is just one for imaging. So again, it shows you the same sort of set of things that we expect to see. So we provide that and we provide the suggested formats of the files. But again, if there's other formats, then we're happy to accept them as long as they're open formats and not proprietary ones. If they're proprietary ones, we have to ask them to, uh, to convert them to something that is more open and more, more sustainable. Um, so why do we go to our office? Well, essentially it's fair. We're trying to make things as open and transparent and reproducible in the scientific publications as we can. It also allows us to spot errors. We assume that errors are made accidentally rather than fraudulently. So sometimes people will write the manuscript and they'll base their numbers on the number of samples that they originally took forgetting the fact that actually some of those failed at the original QC and never got sequenced or something on that line. So you'll end up with a data set that contains 23 samples worth of sequence and their paper says they've sequenced 25 things. You're like, well, okay. <laughs> they, they have to then go back and re rewrite parts of their manuscript based on these numbers. But so that sort of, it helps just with the, the integrity of the papers in that respect. <coughs> I appear to be nearly over time, so I better speed things up. Um, and it gives greater visibility. So if we put the data out there with its own DOI, then people can cite the data set as well. So things that we want to do in the future. So we put all these ontology terms within samples and we use them for, for the data set types. But at the moment, we have a very poor search facility that doesn't really give you the opportunity to make use of those information. So that's something we really want to work on in the future is to um, increase the way that people are able to interact with it and eventually the way that machines are able to interact with it. But that is further down the line yet. We also want to make it easier for people to submit these things to us, easier to upload their files to us and all those sorts of things which take time to, to build. Uh, so I just want to thank everybody for, for your attention. BJ is our main funder, all of our authors, past, present, and future, are the people that we link out to that host other information, other data sets for us. Um, and if you're interested, you can sign up to gigadb.org and get our monthly, new, well, monthly quarterly newsletter. Uh, and these are all the people that are involved with GigaScience. So Post45, so Chris, another Chris, is uh, presenting Post45 uh, today, I think. <laughs> so that we, uh, if you want to come and find out more about uh, the vector-borne disease data sets that we've been hosting, you can come and speak to us there. And then I just want to leave you on that slide, which is a plug for the Genomic Standards Consortium meeting that I mentioned earlier. Thank you. <laughs>